Well, I say the reaction to lock on personal identity, the reactions were various and, and spirited. Um, one set of reactions was turned in by a group we refer to today as the Scriblarians, uh, the Scriblaris Club, named after a character in Arbuthnot. Uh, you all know the names of at least two famous Scriblarians, so I won't cause embarrassment by asking for a show of hands, but Alexander Pope was a Scriblarian, and Jonathan Swift was a Scriblarian. And these were wags, these were literary people who thought that uh, the, the emerging professional classes, particularly the scientific classes, were overstepping their bounds, making promises they couldn't keep, and otherwise frightening children and small animals with various uh, theories. That is, the Scriblarians were opposing what today we would refer to as scientism, which, uh, distinct from science, takes plausible scientific findings and stretches them to the point where one's imagination is overburdened and where the chain of inferences becomes at once alarming and often absurd. So genes become selfish and areas of the limbic system make moral decisions and, you know, that sort of thing. Well, you can imagine how the Scriblarians would have, uh, well, consider Swift, for example, with, uh, with Lilliput. What's the scientific community up to on that island? Well, they're trying to get sunshine from cucumbers. And with enough uh, of a subsidy from the authorities, they might be able to get enough of it to sell it off cheaply. Do you see that sort of thing? Of course, the island is above everybody else. Resistance is responded to by the island coming down and crushing dissenters and so forth. So, so the Scriblarians take a look at Locke's thesis and contrive all sorts of counterintuitive possibilities. Smith takes lethal action against Jones. By the time Smith is arraigned and the trial is held, his consciousness now has radically different contents. His memories have been added to significantly. Perhaps he's lost a number of memories. So the person arraigned is no longer the person being tried. Indeed, the poor corpse on the floor probably had an altered identity even as he fell to his death, that sort of thing. So there was that sort of reductio uh, approach to, to Locke's theory. Now, those who, who had a very sober and serious reaction to it um, found certain theological elements contained in the theory that were especially troublesome. And these were brought to a head by Bishop Butler, Oriel College, Oxford, famous for his work, The Analogy of Religion. And listen to what Butler has to say. He reads Locke on personal identity, and he, he, he offers a dissertation on personal identity, which includes the following lines, which I think you'll find quite interesting. Whether we are to live in a future state, as it is the most important question which can possibly be asked, so it is the most intelligible one which can be expressed in language. Yet strange perplexities have been raised about the meaning of that identity or sameness of person which is implied in the notion of our living now and hereafter or in any two successive moments. And the solution of these difficulties hath been stranger than the difficulties themselves for personal identity has been explained so by some as to render the inquiry concerning a future life of no consequence at all to us, the persons who are actually making it. And though few men can be misled by such subtleties, yet it may be proper a little to consider them. But though consciousness does thus ascertain our personal identity to ourselves,
Yet to say that consciousness makes personal identity or is necessary to our being the same persons is to say that a person has not existed a single moment nor done one action but what he can remember, indeed none but what he reflects on. And one should really think it self-evident that consciousness of personal identity presupposes and therefore cannot constitute personal identity. So his refutation of Locke is this. Locke would have reflection and the elements of consciousness constituting personal identity. Butler wants to say, no, no, it is in virtue of having a personal identity that you are the one doing the reflecting, etc., etc. But the point I, I want to draw your attention to is how he finds a theologically rich area uh, contained in this theory just who is in that future life and, and what is the status of conscious reflection in that future life. And then of course we get to, now, now Butler is publishing in 1736, now we get to Thomas Reed, we get to a sustained philosophical inquiry. But I do want to draw attention to this. Reed devotes almost all of the lines on personal identity to a critique of Locke. In fact, uh, years ago, I hesitate to report how many years ago, um, when Thomas Reed was on the verge of being rediscovered, this once quite estimable figure, uh, signs of the rediscovery were like little bat squeaks. They'd show up here and there. And a major philosophy journal, The Monist, devoted a full issue to the philosophy of Thomas Reed in 1978. Uh, most of you weren't reading Reed at that time. But Tom Beecham and I were, were publishing on Reed at that time. Some of you will know Beecham as the uh, editor of the critical edition of uh, Hume's works. And so Tom decided to be Hume for this purpose, and I decided to be Reed for this purpose. And we published uh, an article titled Personal Identity, Reed's Answer to Hume. Now among the most gauche things that one ever does is one reads one's own lines, but I do want to read you the introduction that we wrote to that work in 1978 because it makes, it makes an interesting point. In the third of his essays on the intellectual powers of man, Reed devotes the fourth chapter to the concept of identity and the sixth chapter to Locke's theory of personal identity. This latter chapter is widely regarded as a definitive refutation of the thesis that personal identity is no more than memories of a certain sort. It's interesting that the term identity and personal identity do not appear as chapter or section titles elsewhere in any of Reed's works, and Hume is neither mentioned nor his theory of personal identity discussed in the two chapters specifically addressed to the matter. Moreover, while Locke, Reed, and Hume are often anthologized in works on personal identity, Reed is always presented as replying to Locke. One explanation for Reed's seeming omission is, of course, that he simply found himself unable to reply to Hume, if I may say so. Uh, Tom Beecham wanted to put that in there. So we quickly follow it with, but in light of the fact that there's scarcely a major proposition advanced in Hume's treatise, which was spared a Reedian critique, this explanation is less than convincing. We offer a different explanation here, that in fact Reed did answer Hume on this point, and that in significant respects Reed's inquiry taken as a whole constitutes his reply, and I shall get back to that. You see, the reply is simply going to be a rehearsal of the defects of the ideal theory, because it is the ideal theory that will ground Hume's theory of personal identity, the bundle of perceptions, do you see? We have no idea of power, that sort of thing, which, we, which we've gone over. Now, what about Reed? Contra Locke.
Reed sees Locke contradicting himself when he defines a person as, quote, an intelligent being endowed with reason and with consciousness, but then allows that person to go out of existence while the intelligent person does not. To bolster this point, Reed then introduces us to the brave officer, which is a famous element in the entire literature on personal identity, Reed and the brave officer, to some extent anticipated in Barclay's Alciphron, but not dealt with in quite the way Reed, Reed does it. Let me read Reed to you, and then I'll provide something of an adumbration on this passage. <coughs> Suppose a brave officer to have been flogged when a boy at school for robbing an orchard, to have taken a standard from the enemy in his first campaign, and to have been made a general in advanced life. So you have a youngster. We don't flog youngsters any longer. We examine them. So he's flogged for stealing fruit from the orchard. A little later on, he distinguishes himself in service to his country. And then in advanced years, he's elevated to the rank of general. So you've got that picture. Suppose also, which must be admitted to be possible, that when he took the standard, he was conscious of his having been flogged at school. And that when he made a general, he was conscious of his having taken the standard but had absolutely lost consciousness of his flogging. So you've got the picture. Here he is, he's a, he's a young officer, he grabs the standard, he's going to lead men in battle, and while this is going on, he remembers once having been flogged for stealing fruit. And then years later, as it elevated to general, well, he remembers grabbing the standard on that fateful day, but has lost all recollection of ever having been whipped for stealing fruit. These things being supposed, it follows from Mr. Locke's doctrine that he who was flogged at school is the same person who took the standard, and that he who took the standard is the same person who was made general. Whence it follows, if there be any truth in logic, that the general is the same person with him who was flogged at school but the general's consciousness does not reach so far back as his flogging. Therefore, according to Mr. Locke's doctrine, he is not the person who was flogged. Therefore, the general is, and at the same time is not, the same person with him who was flogged at school. What Reed is offering is, is a logical argument against Locke's theory, the argument being that by the laws of associativity, if A equals B and B equals C, A equals C. But this isn't working for Locke because the, the brave officer matches up with the child who was flogged, A equals B. The general matches up with the brave officer, C equals B. But the general has no recollection of having been the child, so A doesn't equal C. Now, if this does nothing else, it establishes that whatever kind of identity Locke might have had in mind, it can't be a formal identity, because if it were a formal identity, the principle of associativity would apply. You just, do you follow? You follow that. So Reed is satisfied that there is a formal refutation, at least of Locke's theory. He's not addressing Hume as Noted, he is not addressing here. Reed goes on to point out that absent a conviction of our persisting personal identity, no rational deliberation or course of action would be open to us. He puts it this way in the chapter he, he, he writes on identity itself. This conviction of one's own identity is utterly necessary for all exercise of reason. The operations of reason, whether practical reasoning about what to do or speculative reasoning in the building up of a theory, are made up of successive parts. 
In any reasoning that I perform, the early parts are the foundation for the later ones. And if I didn't have the conviction that the early parts are propositions that I have approved or written down, I would have no reason to proceed to the later parts in any theoretical or practical project whatever. Now, I'm going to underscore something here. Remember that one of Reed's primary ambitions is to see to it that philosophy can form itself to what Reed takes to be the most developed methods of inquiry and explanation. He takes these to be the methods first advanced and defended by Bacon and then brought to a triumphant finale through the achievements of Isaac Newton. So you start with very basic facts. They look simple because they are simple. Here's a simple fact. You could not do an addition problem unless you were able to knit together in time the successive steps involved in adding these numbers. Now, this is something a, a, a six-year-old understands, right? Suppose you had absolutely no conviction and indeed no basis for a conviction that whoever did the 8 plus 5 part is quite different from whoever comes next. You'd have no way of proceeding. Now make the situation a more complex one. You're going to take a bicycle ride into the country and you've, you've got a place in view. You've got a mental map, so to speak, of where it is you're going. But the one thing you don't have is any continuity of your own identity as a person. The, the first movement of the bike and you're lost, do you see? Now, do we have instances of this? We do have some tragic instances of this. Some years ago when we were, BBC and the public broadcasting system were putting together the series on the mind, we had occasion to show the sad fate of Clive Waring, this eminent figure in, in British music, one of the great interpreters of the music of Lassus, Renaissance music of Lassus. And Clive Waring had sustained a bitemporal encephalitis, producing this profound retrograde amnesia. Now there you do have someone who does not have a continuity of identity beyond seconds or a fraction of a minute sort of thing. Now, this is a person who can talk, put him at the keyboard, he plays again, seems to be a, and is a reasonable person in so many respects. He cannot knit together a life for himself. He's very much the sort of character that Reed has in mind. Because knitting a life together involves this sequencing of steps, practical or theoretical or both, in hearing in a continually identical being, Kant refers to the unity of apperception, that this manifold of stimulation finally has to inhere in a, in a continuing entity, a uniting and continuing entity. So, as Reed goes on to note, <clears throat> numerical identity, being, being the same person, requires an uninterrupted continuation. He says, something that stops existing can't be the same thing as something that begins to exist at a later time. For this would be to suppose that a thing existed after it had stopped existing and then existed before it was produced. And he takes this to be absurd. He goes further and says, and here, by the way, you do see him getting close to the critique of Hume and the bundle of perceptions. Reed says, there are no parts of persons. Quote, it is perhaps harder to ascertain precisely the meaning of personhood but all mankind place their personhood 
in something that can't be divided or consist of parts. A part of a person is an obvious absurdity. Now, what's the burden of that proposition? Well, the burden of that proposition is that if personal identity is made up of elements of consciousness, ensembles of ideas, formed out of copies of impressions, then presumably the more of these things you have, the more solid or massive or whatever metric applies of personhood that you have. And to lose bits of it is to lose bits of your personal identity. And this is, must be predicated on the assumption, the silent assumption, that there are parts of persons, fractions of persons, and what Reed wants to claim is that the notion itself is absurd. Now what about this idea that, that personal identity is forged out of collected memories? Now Locke was fully aware of the fact of pseudo-reminiscence. Locke was a doctor, he was a good doctor, he certainly, he, he certainly knew about instances of madness, instances of delusion and hallucination. Locke understood as a citizen of the world and as a doctor that the mere fact that one remembers having done something doesn't establish that one has done it. But Reed, Reed wants to go, go on with this. What makes it the case that I was the person who did such and such it certainly is not my remembering doing it. My remembering doing it makes me know for sure that I did it, but I could have done it without remembering it. The relation to me that is expressed by saying I did it would be the same even if I hadn't the least memory of doing it. This thesis, my remembering that I did such and such, or as some choose to express it, my being conscious that I did it, makes it the case that I did do it seems to me as great an absurdity as this. My believing that the world was created makes it the case that the world was created. Now, Reed's use of a reduction to the absurd is just another defense of core common sense principles and uh, you, you can either you can either buy into this or you you can object, but I I'm going to put the best face on this that 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 I can. The question before the house is what constitutes a reasonable warrant for belief. On what grounds do we accept one theory over another, one set of conjectures over another? one hypothesis over another. Now do we say that uh, given two conflicting hypotheses, if the two of them are of equal formal logical adequacy, there's no grounds on which to choose between them? No, no one would take that position in the practical affairs of life. Logical consistency is a desideratum. But when it comes to choosing something that is going to have a bearing on how we conduct our life, how we understand the world we live in, we're looking for something different from logical consistency. What are we looking for? We're looking for practical usefulness. We're looking for, sorry to put it this way, it's such a terribly vulgar term, we're looking for what works. We might not want to cast ourselves that way. No one wants to be a vulgar consequentialist. No one wants to be a sort of hairy knuckled, if it works, it must be right, it must be true. But when you consult your own experiences, when you have to decide whether the fact that your car did not start this morning is best explained in terms of the suspension of the, all of the laws governing the performance of internal combustion engines, or there's something wrong with your engine. You're going to choose the latter. Why? 
because there's a good warrant for assuming that the laws, the mechanical laws, are not willy-nilly. They are laws, which means that it would be an act of God if all of a sudden all of these laws happened to be suspended just this morning. Now let me try to put not only the best face on it, but a philosophically respectable face on it. Mention a much more modern philosopher who, by the way, reflects quite positively on Thomas Reed, Charles Sanders Peirce. Now Peirce and William James were both famous for advancing something called pragmatism, even as Peirce insisted over the course of decades that what he means by that is not what William James is representing it to be. That's, that's another story. Peirce has a definition of truth that matches up very well with, with Reed on, on common sense precepts. Peirce says the truth is that end point, that terminus ad quem, toward which conclusions move by way of an infinite number of successful experiments. Shall I say that again? What we mean by the truth of a proposition is that end point toward which the claim relentlessly moves by way of an infinite number of successful experiments. Now, what does he mean by successful experiments? He means successful observations, successful manipulations of nature, successful practical attempts to do something. Do you see? And, and the emphasis on infinite number is to reassure everyone that there's no guarantee you ever get there because there's always room for the exception. In fact, the whole project of the scientific <coughs> mission is to find exceptions where so far the relationships have been exceptionless. Now suppose we take that Persian notion as the warrant for anything we're going to hold as a conviction or a belief. Well, in that case, our conviction will be strengthened in proportion to the number of successful experiments that have arisen from the application of the proposition or the principle where? In lived life, in reality, outside the seminar room, down the street, in the attic, in front of the fireplace, on top of the stove, in the machine shop, in the surgery, going to the moon. That's the, that's the warrant. I attach myself to these propositions because. And the answer to the because is to point to an entire range of what? Successful experiments. Do it the other way. You've got something that is logically flawless, or flawless at the level of argument. Let, let's say a systematic skepticism, which David and I have been communicating on. A developed systematic skepticism. And you act on it. And everything you attempt to do fails. You operate on the premise that everything you were prepared to call the external world is nothing but a collection of ideas in your mind. Try that. Try it for 15 minutes. Try it in company. Bring it into the marketplace. Drive your car that way. Now you're chortling. I'm, obviously I am trying to amuse you, but you're picturing yourselves, attaching yourselves to a skepticism of that sort, and saying that 
No harm will be done as I gun this thing and get it up to about 110 miles an hour because after all, it's just something being played out in my mind. And then tell that to the constable who is also being played out in your mind. Well, you begin to get the point. The point is, it's philosophically interesting. It does put certain assertions on notice it might take a form that actually does require a far more disciplined approach to our conjectures and the like. But I, I want to get you back to the question that launched this part of my lecture. What are you prepared to accept as the ultimate warrant when it comes to significant convictions and beliefs? That is the warrant that must be satisfied no matter how many other warrants are satisfied. Reed's argument is that the warrant that has to be satisfied is supplied by lived life. The, the, the warrant arises from what today and somewhat dismissively might be referred to as folk psychology. The sort of thing that gets people through a lifetime, through work, through relations within their families, the raising of children, their education the conduct of civic life, the building of, of uh, cities and so forth. But this is, this, is how, this is how we busy ourselves and what we come to accept or reject is determined by the success we have in attaching ourselves to one or another theory. So can we reduce Reed's approach here to a set of core principles? I shall try. First, establish what the property or power must be that enables us to do certain things and in the absence of which we cannot do certain things. This is, um, uh, you know, when Kant takes, takes a notion like this, he develops what he is pleased to call a transcendental mode of argument. You, you should know that the term transcendental used that way uh, was a neologism. Kant introduced that, that term to be understood that way. A transcendental argument goes like this. You take something that is uncontested. For example, that uh, uh, you, you are certain that you are the person who came into this room uh, as far as you're concerned, that's indubitable. And then you ask yourself, what must be the case for that to be the case? That is, can you find some enabling condition, absent which that wouldn't be the case? Can you find enabling conditions in virtue of which that is the case? So you now have event or object or occurrence A, you have enabling conditions if there ever would be A, and there is A, therefore what? Those are the enabling conditions. Let's just take, take a moment on, on, on Kant. Kant reads Hume as making two claims, only one of which Kant is prepared to accept as valid. If Hume wants to say that all of our knowledge arises from experience, that's fine. Kant stays with that. But if Hume thinks that because of that he is allowed to say that all of our knowledge is grounded in experience, no. Because for there to be experience itself, there are enabling conditions. The external world showers us with absolutely unconnected, incessant events. You can think of it as a shower of radiation, if you like. And out of that incredible manifold, we pull things together in a characteristic way. We pull things together in a spatio-temporal way. So when Hume says something like this, I see before me on a billiard table, one ball move striking another and the second one moves 
and I must own, quote, I cannot see some third term betwixt them. He can't see causation, do you see? Well, what Kant wants to make clear is he also can't see then, and he also can't see out there before me, because space is not a stimulus, time is not a stimulus. So the spatio-temporal aspect of this is provided by the percipient herself. Got it? So that spatio-temporal mode of intuition or apprehension becomes a necessary component if there is to be succession in time and events in space. I'm, I'm not arguing for that, I'm using that as, a, as, as an illustration. Now that illustrates a transcendental argument. We know that events are, are apprehended spatio-temporally. And since you can't get that by way of some physical property of a stimulus, the only other source would be the observer herself. So to get back to what I would take to be core principles in Reed, you first establish what, the pro what property or power is necessary to enable something where that something is indubitable. So you grant that there is X, and now the question is, what has to be in place for there to be X? Then you consider, and this is something that uh, always raises an eyebrow, look at, I have two eyebrows, I'm, I'm able to raise my eyebrows over claims like this. Um, then consider how people over vast stretches of time, geography and culture, have understood the matter. For it is the folk psychology of actual persons engaged in lived life that finally supplies a science of human nature with its data. Now, can we imagine entities that do not apprehend external events spatio-temporally? It's imaginable. Uh, P.S. We can't imagine how they do apprehend external events. But we could imagine that there are entities that don't do it the way we do it. Remember Wittgenstein's line, if a lion could speak, we wouldn't understand him. So it would be the same sort of thing here. Reed actually gives us, in his inquiry in the chapter on seeing, he actually gives us a fictitious group called the Idomeneans. They live in a two-dimensional world, as we live in a three-dimensional world. Now what can you say about the Idomeneans? They will give us, the Idomeneans have no trouble with arithmetic and they have no trouble with Euclidean geometry. They don't have trigonometry. Right. And Reed, by extension, says, we live in a three-dimensional, there might be entities that live in an n-dimensional world. You see. We got Harvey Brown to come in and tell us about modern physics, he'd tell us that you can't even put the ball in play unless you're able to deal with 13 dimensions. And for those of us who still struggle with three, that's an unimaginable burden. So it's not a question of we choose folk psychology because we're too witless to imagine entities radically different from ourselves. It's because there's really no point in envisaging entities radically different from ourselves if, as in the case of Hume, we're trying to develop a science of what? Human nature. So the subject of interest has to be humanity, where it's found over the course of time that it is found, and what it is found doing, or failing to do, or striving to do. Hume did not offer us a systematic scientific approach to any conceivable nature. He wanted to use the methods of Bacon and Newton to subsume human nature under scientific laws and principles. Now, where do you get the subject matter for human nature in lived life? 
You get it from people actually doing things, being a certain way, saying things a certain way, agreeing on the meaning of certain things. And finally, one should then consider whether the philosophical theory or conjecture is firmly grounded in relevant and systematic observations or is instead just another construction from the armchair. One aspect of Hume's philosophy that Reed finds extremely troublesome is Hume's inclination to universalize principles based on what introspectively he finds to be the case with himself. Now, if you really were given to skepticism, suppose you wanted to conclude that, well, Hume is insane or deluded or he's an outlier. His philosophy works just fine just in case you're Hume. Now, no, no one says that, no one thinks that. But when you take a look at Reed's chapter of seeing, what is he going into? He's, he's going into systematic works in optics. He's looking at conditions of visual pathologies. Famously, uh, uh, Locke and Hume have this theory according to which impressions of sense strike us in a certain way and uh, copies are made of these impressions. Do you see copies are made of these impressions? Recall the geometry of visibles. What's the geometry of visibles all about? You don't see a copy of the impression. You see what's in the external world. Do you see? And, and why is Reed devoting his time to a geometry of visibles? Because the metaphor of copy, unless Hume really means it to be a copy, but the metaphor of copy only matches up with things visible. There aren't copies of odors. There aren't copies of tastes. How would the mind make a copy of a taste, do you see? So if the theory were going to work at all, it would only work with visual stimuli. And it doesn't work with those. The point Reed wants to make is that what he's done to establish this is what any scientist would do who had come up with a theory according to which what the mind possesses are copies of impressions. You, you, can, you can test something like that, you see. Now the test isn't going to be the last word on the subject, but it surely should be the first word on the subject once the theory has been advanced. So methodologically, Hume has not lived up to the billing that he gave the treatise. This is not the application of Newtonian and Baconian principles. By the way, I'm not suggesting for a moment that uh, that chapter in philosophy of science is settled and the method we should be using is Bacon's methods. Um, or, or even suggesting that the methods used by Newton were Baconian methods. Um, the Newton who frames no hypothesis, you know, he spent a whole lifetime framing hypotheses. Uh, now what do we want to say about personal identity? Well, in my tragic youth, um, I thought it might be useful just to clear up the terminology here because there seemed to be a lot of confusion uh, surrounding different senses of personal identity. I wasn't tragically youthful. I think it was maybe 30 years ago. So I was in my prime. Aristotle says the body is in its prime at 28 and the mind at 49. So I have a guess as to how old he was when he said that. I thought that one should make a distinction between personal identity, self-identity, and self. And uh, I, I wrote several very, very good arguments for this, widely adopted by me. Uh, and I, I don't know that anyone else has, uh, well, perhaps it's just 
slow to grow on the imagination of my contemporaries. Look, you can go into a room filled with strangers. You know who you are. But nobody in the room knows who you are. Uncorrupted by philosophical education, that's what most people would take the term personal identity to mean. Do you know that person? Do you know the identity of that person? If you went to an FBI agent and said, I am interested in his personal identity, well, we'd start looking at fingerprints and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now suppose you went into a room filled with people who know you very well, but unfortunately you were amnesic. Well, we could say at that point that you have a robust personal identity, you're widely known to be a given person, but you have no self-identity. That is, a lot of people know who you are, but you don't know who you are. Now these are two cases that anyone can think of. So they're not philosophically interesting. But now, suppose you're amnesic and in a room filled with strangers. You don't know who you are, and they don't know who you are, but you certainly know that you are. That is to say, you've got this continuing awareness of selfhood without being able to supply any defining data, identifying data that would allow people to locate you in a phone directory, etc. Do you see? Now, the, the, if I may say, the, is, the identity issue that I found most interesting would be the continuity of selfhood or shall I say the persistence of selfhood because I, I'm, I'm fearful of being entirely unclear on this point. Look, once you abandon the terms personal identity and self-identity and you just take up the term self or selfhood simplicity, then of course personal identity and self-identity can change all over the map. But from the earliest moments of anything answering to the, the description conscious life until the end of conscious life. The entity that has conscious life just has that awareness, that awareness of what it's like to have a pain, what it's like to taste the food, etc. Now how does that persist amidst bodily changes and changes due to age, etc., etc.? And is that nothing but a bundle of perceptions? Because if anything is going to hold up as a bundle of perceptions, it, it would be selfhood. But it certainly wouldn't be personal identity and self-identity. I just, and why do I say that with, with some confidence? You recall Hume's, the appendix that Hume wrote and his attitude, his judgment of how well he had handled this issue of personal identity. He, he said, look, I, I throw my hands up. And I think if he had given up the Lockean personal identity project and just got to awareness and treated that as a bundle of perceptions, that would have been uninteresting but I think probably impregnable. It would be one of those philosophical contributions, utterly unimportant and almost certainly true. So, finito.